we're glad to have you tonight as we are once again studying the book of Jude. We want to welcome John Rosenstern tonight. We want to welcome Dave Smith, Gabe, and Dr. Dave Watts, and uh, we want to welcome you as well. Last week as we were studying, well, let me just, before I say that, I want to encourage you to get the ministry commentary on the book of Jude. It's actually four books in this commentary, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Jude. And I, I think it would be a great addition uh, to your library because we're not able, because of time, to go into exhaustive detail on every verse. And I think this commentary would help you. As we said last week, Bible scholars say that Jude is the most neglected book of the New Testament. I don't know why. It's a powerful book. And, uh, and I think that you need this commentary, and it will help you. Last week, in our introduction of the first three verses, we established that Jude was the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. We established the fact that he had intended to write a letter uh, concerning salvation similar to the book of Romans. But as he sat down to write, the Holy Spirit strongly moved upon him to change direction and to write what we now have as the book of Jude. And uh, verse 4, as we read it tonight, will get into the reason why the Holy Spirit moved upon him to change direction, to deal with the subject matter at hand. I'll read the, uh, the verse, and uh, Gabe, you'll read the notes. For there are certain men crept in unawares. False teachers had crept into the church. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men. They came in by stealth and dishonesty. However, their methods were by no means new. They would assume an outward expression of light. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Refers to the fact that grace has been turned to license. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. If we deny the cross, which is God's plan of redemption... We are at the same time denying both the Father and the Son. Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to teach your word. We ask for your help, your guidance, your anointing. We pray that what we bring out tonight will be strengthening, will be enlightening, will be a help to the body of Christ here in the sanctuary and those by SBN. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. Verse 4 tells us that there was a problem beginning in the early church of that day, and it's a problem that has been here from the very beginning, and that is false teachers bringing in false doctrine. If Satan cannot stop the work of God externally, he seeks to infiltrate the word, work of God, the church, the body of Christ, to steer them in another direction. False doctrine is probably the greatest threat in the kingdom of God today. The greatest enemy is not the world. It's the world in the church. It's Satan infiltrating the church. He noticed, notice here he used some descriptive language. He said certain men. Now, who these men were, we don't know. The Holy Spirit did not lead you to give us direction or information as to who they were. They could have been Judaizers. They could have been Gnostics. They could have been both, or it could have been another group altogether. But whatever was the problem, it was strong enough and serious enough that the Holy Spirit stirred the heart of this man who had sat down, as we said earlier, to write something else and strongly moved upon him to warn the church. And if he did that then, how much more is he doing that now? Because the fact of the matter is, because of technology, television, radio, internet, false doctrine has never infiltrated the church to a greater degree than it is today. 
And it's really not necessary for us to call names as to who is teaching false doctrine, even though there's a time and a place for that, and sometimes it has to be done. But really the key is that you as a child of God, the Holy Spirit expects you to have a close enough relationship with him and to know the word of God well enough for yourself that these false practitioners don't have to be identified by name. Hello? But they will be identified by the era that they teach and you will recognize it as such. He used the term crept. That means to, uh, one of the meanings of that word crept is to slip in by a side door. And the idea of this, what is being said here is that these false teachers, they slipped into the church under the guise of righteousness, using all of the language and the terminology of the church, born again, spirit filled, glory to God, hallelujah, all of this. You know, and you must never forget that, that all false doctrine, what makes it so seductive is that there's always a portion of truth attached to it. But only enough truth to take the believer that does not know the Word of God well enough for himself, only enough truth that they can begin to direct them down different paths. Any comments? Uh, you know, Charles Spurgeon famously said that one devil inside the church could do more damage than a thousand outside of the church. So when these uh, false teachers slip in, uh, slip in like you said, uh, Robertson's Greek commentary described it that way as like slipping in through a side door. And false doctrine, I would agree, is the, probably the biggest threat to the church. And biblical illiteracy among churchgoers among Christians, people don't know the Word of God, so they don't know any better. The, the only word they get is what they hear from their pastor on Sunday morning. Uh, there's a, alarming statistics about how little people read the Word of God. Well, you, you know, do you realize there are some churches that tell their people, don't bring your Bible? Yeah, yeah. Because the turning of the pages can disturb someone sitting close by you? Yeah. Or if they do bring a Bible, it is not really a word-for-word -word translation. It is a paraphrase, and, and which, which is not the Word of God. And you, you can't know that would be like a pilot at Delta when I get on the plane tomorrow saying that he just graduated from the paraphrase flight school. <laughs> I'm sure there were some things left out, and I don't want to be on that plane. And, uh, but so this, this, and this idea of creeping in, as I was studying this uh, in, in the Greek, it has the idea of hypocrisy, of someone uh, ad addressing themselves, like an actor would dress for a, a role, but he would put on a mask to play a part. And these false teachers, they, they dress the part, but they're wearing a mask. And the, and the thing about it, and notice in the next part, it says they are, the Holy Spirit through Jude calls them ungodly. So you've got to understand something as the body of Christ. Anything that's not in the Word of God, anything that's not true to the Word of God, the practitioner or the proclaimer of that, the Holy Spirit calls them ungodly. So we're not talking about a little error here. But we're talking about something that can lead the body astray and actually lead them into bondage and even to the loss of their souls. That word for creep is paris duo. Yes. And the idea here also has to do with stealthiness. Yeah. One of the more popular movements that we've discussed over the years, the Purpose Driven Life Movement, its author used the very term that he brought his doctrine in under the radar, intentionally, yes, stealthily, to bring it in, first of all, to subvert pastors and then bring their influence to their congregations. Purpose Driven Church was first written, then the Purpose Driven Life followed thereafter. The church book was for the pastors, the Purpose Driven Life was for the people. So when you start to look at their intentions, you begin to see what they're drawing out. Second Peter chapter, chapter 2, 
deals very much with right. what Jude is doing with here. So you exactly. can almost read these as sister scriptures because of the things that they bring out. Peter says that they allure through the lust of the flesh. And this is why the message of the cross is so important in this hour because it lets us really understand and discern the difference between what is of the spirit, what is of the flesh. And if your faith is in the wrong object, obviously the sensualness of false doctrine is going to draw one because it'll lure them it through the lust sensual. of the flesh. Yeah. It is Proverbs called it the evil woman. The evil woman. Uh, jo George Williams, the Irish scholar in this verse, he said this statement. I want to read it. He said the apostasy of the last days will be both doctrinal and moral. The root, he said, of rebellion is self-will. We're going to touch on that more and more as we go through these verses. We're going to see where pride and self-will is one of the prime motives of the falling away. He said, this rebellion will not be abated but will only get worse until the coming of the Lord. And I believe we're in those days of the greatest delusion that's coming. Uh, we saw, we've seen the, 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 uh, the teaching of the grace revolution that swept the church. If, if you're a Christian, you never have to repent anymore. You don't have to tell the Lord you're sorry. All of this falls in to what Jude is talking about here. And, and then he said, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. That word lasciviousness is only used, I think, five times in the entirety of the Word of God. And it has a multitude of meanings. But the best meaning, as, as Jude is using it here, I, I think would be perverted faith. Perverted faith. And the idea is this. Anything that's not Christ and him crucified is perverted. It's not a, fall, a true message. It is a false message. And it will not lead people to the Lord. It will lead people away from the Lord. You know, Donnie, you bring up a great point here because much of these church growth movements that we're discussing and have been discussing, they'll take the terminology of the Word of God but they'll apply a different meaning to it, neo-orthodoxy. They will take a different meaning to it. So somebody that would read, or I had Christians reading, for example, books like The Purpose Driven, and when they read it and they see the Christian terms, they take their understanding of Christian terminology and apply it, but that's not what the author's intention was. No, it, it's, an, it's designed to deceive. Think what Jesus said, two things. We have to watch out for the wolves in sheep's clothing, and that's what this is here, these false teachers. They appear to be something they're not. Secondly, he said in Matthew chapter 24, four times he said, talked about deception. Beware that no man deceive you. Their intention is to deceive you, to lure you in, just as it says back there in, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 13 pertaining to false prophets. Also, when you look at other places, like in Ezekiel chapter 13, very clearly the Lord said they speak out of their own vain imaginations, but I didn't speak to them. And just because the false prophets said the reason they guaranteed that their doctrine was true was they said, look at our following. So a lot of people yeah. will say, because we have a large following, that proves that what we're saying is right. That's not true. Yeah, the, the, the size of the crowd or the money or the prestige or the popularity mm -hmm is not the judge, it's the Word of God. Amen. Verse 5, I will therefore... Let, let me just throw something out. I think we see a large lack of discernment in the body of Christ. Uh, people are depending on a leader to uh, and just be a follower and not really have a good knowledge of the Word of God so that they can make their own decisions but that's tremendously important in a believer's life. We need to know the Word of God ourselves. Well, the, the, Dave, you're right. The idea is so many, because I've heard them say it, that, you know, I work for a living. I've got kids in school. i got to get up before dawn to get my kids up. i got to work this life. So you just tell me what to believe. Yeah. And, and that would be great if everybody was telling the truth. Right. But when we stand before the Lord... It's not going to be what brother so-and-so said. Mm -hmm. It's going to be what the Word of God said. And so these teachers, they, as Satan comes as an angel of light, mm -hmm. so too are his false teachers masked in that mm -hmm. aura of light, of religious light. Mixing. 
we've talked about mixing multiple times, but mixing, and you mentioned, mentioned an element of truth, but mixing truth with, with error uh, is a tremendous uh, problem in the church today. Well, what, it was, what was it that Lawrence said during camp meeting? If you get it half right, you've got it all wrong? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the how true a statement. Verse well, let me add one more thing to that before you go on to verse 5. They may look like us. They may act like us. They may talk like us. But their speech is like a dragon. It's perverse. Yeah. And it's meant to destroy. Well, it's perverted faith. It's perverted faith. It's, it's, uh, it's at, the, at the end of all, the, the end result of the, pract the, the proclaimer of false doctrine is several things. Money. Money is always involved. Control, always. Power. And that's what we, if, if, if the shepherd, un, well, let me use this terminology, there's only one shepherd, Jesus Christ. I'm not a shepherd, I'm an under-shepherd. And all ministers should refer to themselves as under-shepherds, not as the shepherd. But if I want you to believe everything I say, but your soul is more important than you liking me. So you better know the word for yourself. I have, and God, here's what I'm saying. I have never one time open, got up and preached something wrong on purpose. But as a human, I've been wrong. There are things that I believe today at 69 and preach that I preached it different 20 years ago, but I have more maturity and more understanding of the word today. And, uh, but we, we, all are, we all are responsible for our own salvation. We can't leave it up to someone else. Now, after he identifies these men, he goes and he gives examples. He said in verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Suggest something of anxiety and upbraiding, which may be compared to the tone of Paul in writing Galatians. Though you once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them who believed not. Unbelief destroyed the Israelites in the wilderness, and it will do the same presently. Now, many times people reading the book of Jude, when they get to this fifth verse, they don't understand, well, wait a minute, Jude's talking about false teachers and false doctrine in verse 4. And in verse 5, he's jumping back in time, and he's talking about Israel and rebellion in the wilderness, and, and they don't understand the correlation. And the correlation is, first of all, when he said, I will there put you in remembrance, he said, let me remind you of something you should already know. And when he talks about the children of Israel in the land of Egypt and, and the rebellion and that, that it, their unbelief and what it cost them, he is trying to show us that judgment comes when we err from the Word of God. And here's what people don't understand. False doctrine leads you away from the Word of God and the truth of God until whether many times you no longer believe the truth. The children of Israel in rebelling against the Word of God to go in and occupy the land is no different than what happens with these false teachers. When you succumb to these false teachers, you are rebelling against the Word of God. And in essence, you are operating in unbelief. The, God saved the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. He preserved them. He brought them out with a mighty hand. He fed them when they were hungry. He provided water when they were thirsty. He did everything for them. And yet, when he told them to occupy the land and their refusal, here's what people are saying. Their refusal, in effect, was saying, we're not interested in God's plan. God's plan was for Israel to occupy the land for the express purpose of the bringing forth of the Messiah. So, their rebellion actually delayed the plan of God. 
and it costs them their soul. So he's trying to remind you that when you refuse to go God's way, there is a price to pay. And what was that price? Well, hold on, Donnie. In, in Hebrews 3.13, that bears it out perfectly. Israel failed to go in because of the deceitfulness of sin, hardened their, their hearts. So when you get away from the way of God, your heart does get hardened. And there does come a place where you no longer want to desire the truth and of the Lord. that's what false doctrine does. It does. It pulls you away from the false covenant. False teachers. They, 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 you know, I saw some, this, this doesn't go along with necessarily somebody getting behind the pulpit and preaching. A, a, well, yeah, it does. Let me correct myself. But I saw something. It, it, I got cold shivers when I saw it. It was uh, in January when the Super Bowl. And I was looking for something, a, 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 a message of a preacher on YouTube. And I came across a YouTube clip of a major, major church. I had never heard of the church. I was so shocked by what I saw, I looked it up, and it, it's a big, it's a, they run thousands and in, in the Midwest. And it was their big Super Bowl Sunday. Let me just throw this aside. We shouldn't have Super Bowl Sundays in church. We're here to have church. Amen. Amen. That's, we're here to have church. All the pastoral staff was dressed in football jerseys or referees' jerseys. The weirdest sight. And so they were, one of the pastors comes out on the platform and blows the whistle to start the service, to start the game. Well, how do you start a football game? You kick off. So they had one of the pastors on their knees, on his knee, like getting ready to kick off. And I, could, I knew he had, I could tell he was holding something. I thought it was a football. And I thought, are they actually going to kick a football? And, and then they had another pastor as the kicker. And then the camera widened out as the pastor ran to kick it. And what they were kicking was not a football. It was the Bible. Yeah, good. It was the Bible. And I just stood there. I mean, I sat there, and I just, it was one of those things. I said, look, I didn't see that right. There's something I've missed here. And I watched it again, and I watched it several times. And the only thing that I could come to, like, are these people in leadership, are they even saved? We're talking about people's souls here. And when you are, so that told me that what they were teaching in that church was not the Word of God. Because there was no conviction on their part. There was no respect. There was no awe, the holy awe no of the fear, things of God. No fear of they're, God. They're, uh, you know, they got a lot of kickback for that. They said, well, we believe that church should be fun. That's what they told the news. We think church should be fun. And I mean, it was roundly, soundly condemned by secular news. People showing it just couldn't believe that these people would kick off with a Bible. It made me think of uh, William Tyndale in the 1400s was strangled and burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English so that the common person could read it. And here we have people kicking the Bible. I mean, William Tyndale is one example of literally millions who have been martyred, who have been, who would just, even today in the world, people who don't have the Bible in their own language that would just want one page, one book, and here we are kicking it off like a football. I mean, it's just you unfathomable. Have, you don't have church by denigrating the Bible. That's right. Well, that told me that what they were doing in that church was totally contrary to the way of God. So they are no different. They're in rebellion. And if, if, if repentance doesn't come, how many people, including the leadership of that church, is going to lose their soul? Because he made it very plain here. Afterward, destroy them who believe not. And I'm just going to say it right now. I don't remember the name of the church, but they don't believe. They don't believe. This book is holy. This book is life. This book is God's revelation of his son to man. 
everything we need to live, and the last thing we need to be doing is kicking it. We need to cherish it. Amen. Amen. I mean, when we distribute these expositors, I mean, I've, I've been on distributions when people in these country, third world countries, when you would hand them the Bible, I watched one man pull it to his chest and hug it, and tears rolling down his cheek. I can remember on Mother's Program, we had a dear sister from Africa who, whose husband was head over the pastor's union in a Marxist country. And, and he was, they, she was relating to us how, what you said about a pay, that some of their pastors out in the bush, they had pages of the Bible. Not a Bible, but pages. And they would meet up and trade pages so that what few pages they have could be circulated. And she said, when we went out there, and they couldn't, they couldn't afford Bibles. And she said that when we went out there and we distributed those Bibles, she said for the majority of those pastors, that was the first time in their born-again experience they had ever had a complete Bible. And here we are treating it like an inanimate object, Ichabod. Anybody who had any spiritual discernment, when they kicked the Bible off, they should have stood up and walked out. I mean, there's no, I just don't see how any born-again believer with any ounce of discernment could sit and, and be a part of that. I mean, I would have walked out. Well, you know, I'm, I may have a lot of flaws. Uh, it may be, be some things I don't do right but I will never do anything to bring shame or denigrate the Word of God, ever. It must be treated with, with respect and, and honor. And so, destruction was the end result of Egypt. Destruction will be the end result of these false teachers and those that follow them. Verse 6, and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. These particular angels did not maintain their original position in which they were created, but transgressed those limits to invade territory foreign to them, namely the human race. They left heaven and came to earth, seeking to cohabit with women, which they did. He, the Lord, has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. These angels are now imprisoned and will be judged at the great white throne judgment, then placed in the lake of fire, where they will remain forever and forever. These were, of course, uh, in the notes, Genesis 6, 4. This is the story of the, the fallen angels, a few of them that came down and that they, they had relations with women, all for the express purpose to pollute the bloodline, yeah. which tells us that Satan has knowledge of the plan of God. And so these, these angels coming down, having relations with these women to destroy the bloodline, this is where the giants came from. Uh, they, 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 this, this mongrel race, if you will, and it was all done to stop the plan of God. Now let me ask this question. In, in 1 Peter chapter 3, we read, you know, where Jesus, when, and, uh, when he was in the tomb, he went down into Tartus or Hades, and, and he preached to the spirits. Now, I believe that, that these were the spirits he preached to, these fallen angels. And some, I'm saying I believe because some don't. But I, uh, these were, when we read that, this is what he's talking about. And the reason the idea, so the question must be asked, well, why were these locked away and not the rest? of the fallen angels, and that's a good question. But uh, the answer to that is very simple. Uh, angels were created for an express purpose. They were to be messengers of God. Their habitation was heaven. Heaven was created for them, it's, it, one might say. Actually, heaven was not created for us. Our abode, our soul and spirit goes to heaven now, but our true abode is going to be the new heaven and the new earth. So it was, it was heaven was their habitation, but through rebellion, pride, they fell. They threw their lot in with Satan. 
this group, however many it was, had these relations with these women. The idea is this, that they, they entered into something that they were not created to do. It was unnatural. Even though, I know most Christians don't, they think, you know, that angels, they, they don't understand angels having the ability to do this, but the, all the Bible says that they're not given in marriage, but it never says they don't have the ability to do what these fallen angels did. And so they did what was unnatural. They did what God did not create them to do. And the whole attempt was to stop the plan of God. Going back now to verse 4 and verse 5, all of these false teachers, Israel in the wilderness, that was all Satan's attempt to stop the plan of God. So never forget, all false doctrine in the church is devised by Satan to do two things, to get us off track and to stop the work of God. And how sad it is when, in many cases, well-meaning Christians get caught up in this and they are supporting that, which is not helping the work of God, but is hindering the work of God. Then he said in verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. The Greek text introduced a comparison showing a likeness between the angels of verse 6 and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the likeness between them lies deeper than the fact that both were guilty of committing sin. It extends to the fact that both were guilty of the same identical sin giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. The angels cohabited with women. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them was homosexuality. Are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. Those who engage in the sin of homosexuality and refuse to repent will suffer the vengeance of the lake of fire. Now the reason why Jude and the Holy Spirit is comparing the fallen angels that cohabitated with women and the sin of homosexuality is because both acts are unnatural. And they are against the nature of what God created us to be. We, God created the man and the woman to cohabitate, to, to join together in marriage to bring forth children. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, the sin of homosexuality, is men with men, women with women, working that which is unseemingly and unnatural, and let's just say it this way, perverted and ungodly. Homosexuality is one of the most crowning sins in the world today. And the reason why is, is because it's man's rebellion against God's divine order. It's his rebellion against God's divine order, first of all, of the home. God created, the home was the first institution that God created. Satan hates marriage. The strength of a nation is homes that are together. I read... I, when, when, when President Johnson, I read this the other day, when President Johnson introduced the great society mm -hmm. with the idea of, of, of funneling now what is billions of dollars against, uh, given to those that he called marginalized, with the express purpose of trying to say that money could make people rise. Most people don't know this. The strongest home unit in America was the African-American home. They had the highest percentage of marriage and the smallest percentage of divorce. They had stronger marriages, more stable marriages, because they were in God's order. God created man and woman to marry, to create, to bring forth children, to create a stable environment. Yes, they were 
underfunded. Maybe they didn't have the jobs that others had. But while the white population were seeing divorce rates soar to where they're at 50%, they had a stable home. But until, but when the money started flooding in and they found out that they could make more money by having more children, well, a wife can only bring forth so many children. But what happened was this. Now, they are the least protected home. Therefore, the reason for one of the largest, the reason, one of the reasons for the, the reason for the high crime in the African-American community is there are no fathers in the home. The, the welfare system that they created encouraged uh, you would have less money if the, if the man was in the home. Yes. And so it caused that separation. Well, and now you've got men who make a living by getting women pregnant. Mm -hmm. And, and, and but, the, but the point I'm making in all of this is that all of this is a direct attack by Satan to destroy the home. Homosexuality now. Mm -hmm. It comes in and says, it raises its fist at God and says, we know better than you. You created me this way. He didn't. And we do, we're going to join the male with the male, the woman, the female with the female. We're going to marry together. But it's unnatural. It cannot produce its own. Two men cannot produce a child. Of course, you've got a lot of so-called doctors today saying, yeah, men can have babies. Transgenderism and all the lists. And it's just, but the more, the, the more, the further out you get with this, the crazier you become until we have the transgender problem. And, and, and so he is tying the two together. And dad brought out, I'm going to read something that, that dad wrote in the, the commentary. This is a reason, one reason why you need to give it. He said, uh, under, under the statement, giving themselves over to fornication presents the type of sin committed by the fallen angels and the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. Some claim that adultery is unlawful relationship between those who are married, while fornication pertains to those who are unmarried. That is incorrect. The definition of adultery pertains to unlawful relationship between men and women, whether they are single or married. And yet, the term adultery is much more limited than the term fornication. In other words, now listen to this. In other words, all fornication is adultery, but all adultery is not fornication. For, then he described, he gives the, the he said, uh, fornication covers a wide spectrum of unlawful acts, unlawful according to the word of God. And it encompasses the following, adultery, whether the people are married or single, incest, idolatry and adultery respecting idol gods, harlotry, prostitution, spiritual harlotry. Paul addressed that and in the book of Romans. How many in the church today are committing spiritual adultery? And then homosexuality. Homosexuality is, is fornication. And, and so these, these cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, these angels, even though the angel went with women, Sodom and Gomorrah was men with men, the whole idea is, is they left their natural use of their bodies. And they did that which was unnatural. And what happened? Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I want to make a statement. I... I I don't, well, I know it's the Lord that did this, but Mother's Program, uh, Francis and Friends, has a large homosexual viewing audience. They send their emails in. They've even called in. And I want to say to right now, I want to address them if there's anyone watching that is battling this. We're not opposed 
to the homosexual to be opposed to them. We, we, we will never do anything to harm you. We will never do anything to hurt you. But we love you enough to say to you that that which you are engaged in is sin. It will not lead, you cannot be saved and engaged in that lifestyle. But we also want to say that there is deliverance. There is a way of escape. When Jesus died on the cross, he died to atone for every sin, no matter how despicable it may be. And he died to break every bondage, no matter how vile and how gripping. And the, the bondage of homosexuality is even worse than the bondage of drugs and alcohol. But God can set you free. Yeah. He died to set you free. You know, the word lasciviousness, aselgia in the Greek, also means debauchery. Yes. Unbridled lusts. Perversions. It gets worse and worse. It doesn't stay static. It gets deeper and deeper. So one that doesn't come out of it will find themselves getting deeper involved in these things. The end result of this lifestyle is eternal damnation. So we love the homosexual community enough to tell them what you're doing is sin. But God can set you free. Amen. Verse 8, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Jude likens these false teachers to filthy dreamers and refers to their doctrines as being the fruits of mere imagination and fancies. They despise dominion. They refuse to live by the word of God, but rather fabricate their own religion. And speak evil of dignities. Refers to reviling the word of God, and more particularly Christ and the cross. Now notice what the Lord he called them earlier ungodly. Here he calls them filthy dreamers. And what the idea of this, of this term, filthy dreamers, is that they create scenarios in their mind to deceive you. And then they present those scenarios. And because there is an anointing behind false doctrine, if you don't understand that and know what is being said to you is false, that, that false doctrine backed by a, a, the powers of darkness can seduce. It appeals to the flesh. And, and so, you know, this is not my terminology. This is the terminology of the Holy Spirit. He's saying here, Jew, through Jude, that all false teachers are filthy dreamers. That's what God thinks of them. They despise dominion. That means that they don't care what the Word of God says. They don't care about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they despise the, the heart. The true heart is they really despise the things of God. And they speak evil of dignities. That's speaking of the Word of God. That's speaking of Lord Jesus Christ. And really, when he gets right down to it, and Dad says it in the note, refers to reviling the Word of God and more particularly Christ and the cross. When it gets right down to it, as we've got to close, all false doctrine is presented to repudiate Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's really what it is. It is to bring us away from the cross. And let's, let's get verse 9, and we'll close. Yet Michael the archangel. No other angel bears the title of archangel as recorded. There are others who are chief angels, and Michael is only one of them. When contending with the devil... He disputed about the body of Moses. After the death of Moses, Satan demanded the body of the lawgiver, which was denied him by Michael the archangel. Did not bring against him, against Satan, a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. A railing accusation would have placed Michael on the same level with the devil, to which the great archangel would not stoop, and rightly so. When he says archangel, that word archangel means first in rank or chief of angels. 
So it tells us that Michael is a mighty angel. And the, the situation that Jude is talking about here, you can read it in Deuteronomy chapter 34. When Moses died, it's very, it's, it, this is a beautiful thought that, that he died away from the children of Israel, but he only died when God said it was your time. But we find in Deuteronomy that God officiated his funeral. And God either himself directly buried him or Michael, the archangel, did under the direction of God the Father telling him what to do and where, somewhere in Moab. And so the idea is, first of all, what was this disputing about the body? Well, Satan wanted the body of Moses. And the reason for it was this. The children of Israel, having been in Egypt for so long, they were used to idols. And they were prone to worshiping idols. We saw that with the golden calves. That's the first thing they did. And so it seems it was the plan of Satan. If I can get this body, I can display it. And the children of Israel will begin to worship it and make an idol out of it. That tells us that, that are there idols in the church today? Yes, there are. Your favorite preacher can be an idol. Your church can be an idol. But we have no other gods before us. We thank God for good churches. We thank God for good preachers. But Jesus Christ is the Lord. Amen. And nobody else. And we've got to close with this. Did not bring a railing accusation. The whole idea in this is that Michael, and you need to get this, Michael the archangel knew the ground that he stood on. And the ground that he stood on was the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he didn't have to get into an argument and a screaming match with the devil. He just said by the authority of the Word of God and the power of God, Satan, you are rebuked. The Lord rebuke you. Don't have a conversation with the devil. Just rebuke him in the name of Jesus. Amen. You don't have to get down and scream at him and do all of this stuff. Don't get down on his level, but stand on the level you are. You are a child of God, bought with a price, your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you and use the authority that's been given you. But you've got to understand where that authority comes from. It doesn't come from us. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll pick up next Wednesday night with verse number 10. Did you learn anything tonight? Did you enjoy this? Let's all stand and have a word of prayer. Father, we come before you tonight in the name of your son, Jesus. And we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as the body of Christ. And we pray that that which we have brought forth is a blessing to the people and that when we're through that they will have a greater understanding of the book of Jude and that they will understand what the Word of God is and has for them. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Turn around, shake hands with someone. We'll see you Sunday morning.